I'm Jim Juno, and this is Lights, Camera, Author. John Sonny Franzese reportedly committed his first murder at the age of 14. As a made man for the Colombo crime family, he operated out of his Long Island home, specializing in racketeering, fraud, loan sharking, and other illicit deeds that he would deny to his dying day. His career in organized crime spanned over eight decades and intertwined with the careers and lives of Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Jane Mansfield, and several others. He was sentenced to 50 years in prison for robbery charges, but even behind bars, Sonny Franzese never stopped doing business. Sonny, the last of the old-time mafia bosses by S.J. Petty, is the true story of an old-school mafioso as it's never been told before. I interviewed S.J. Petty for this episode of Lights, Camera, Author. S.J. Petty, you have a new book out called Sonny, the last of the old-time mafia uh, bosses. Is that right? Yes, uh, yes, yes. And it's the it's the life story of Sonny Franzini. Or, uh, Fran, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Franzisi. Well, it, I pronounce it Francis. I've heard it Francis. Uh, he pronounced it. Francis or Francis. Francis or Francis. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And your author, your, your, uh, your uh, um, byline is S.J. Petty, but let's talk about your real name is Sandra Petty. Yes. Which, which is what Newsday publishes on your yeah. articles under. Yes. Tell me why the book is S.J. Petty. Well, my editor has never published a mob book by a woman, and he didn't think anyone would buy a mob book by a woman. And I, like a lot of women of my generation, came up with feminism and women's liberation, and perhaps I could have made a stand, but I thought, I think he's right. Wow. And, I, yeah. So we'll see what happens. People are buying it anyway, but it is, and my agent, <laughs> after he read the book, he called me up and he said, I couldn't tell you were a woman. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess that's a good thing. But I do think it's a little different than other mob stories because I very much focused on Sonny's family mm -hmm. and on his second wife, Tina, who was lovely and intelligent and not a typical mob mall at and all she, she stood up to him a lot too didn't she oh she fought him tooth and nail and one of the things i i, I describe a lot of their fights because i have the fbi notes of those fights because the fbi in 1962 secretly put bugs in their kitchen wall and they took notes of all the fights that sunny and tina had it was completely know. illegal yeah, <laughs> but it was the 60s, right? I mean, yes, yes, yes. You know, the amazing thing when I was reading, um, I was reading the uh, intro on um, on Amazon, and I found some found some entries on on the web, excerpts from the book and stuff. So, um, if I say something wrong, please forgive me. Um, I was sent a book, and apparently, it got lost in the mail somewheres you know so. oh no we'll have to rectify that no that's okay i mean it's good yeah i mean so um but what happened is that he um and you know lights camera author is always dealing with books about the entertainment field and every once in a while we go off on this tangent of, of mobsters but sunny is was he the was he the inspiration for the sunny corleone character in the godfather well, he believed he was. He absolutely believed he was. And I asked him a lot about that. And he said, well, Mario Puzo was a neighbor. I said, well, what kind of neighbor? He, well, he lived 20 minutes from me. Well, <laughs> there are a lot of people <laughs> who are not exactly neighbors. But he came to believe um, that Bonanno, who was uh, Joe Bonanno, who was a uh, uh, not liked by other mobsters because he had he had planned a coup that failed and he called him Joe Bananas, but he believed that Joe Bananas planted the idea with Mario Puzo to make him look bad, to make it look like he was telling civilians the true story of the mafia. Mario Puzo, for his part, wrote a memoir he, where he said, it was all research. I didn't hang with mobsters, um, but he did gamble. And if you gamble, yeah, and if you gamble big, you're you're going to interact with mobsters. That's just a fact of life. So, who knows? 
Amazing. And that's what, you know, and that's, and that's where he, uh, where he got the idea of, that just because, I mean, he was named Sonny, both, both people were named Sonny and they were both mobsters. Yes. And, and of course, The Godfather was one of his favorite movies, of course, of course yeah. it many times and analyzed scenes and thought it was very true to life. Uh, he thought, um, I guess Al Pacino was his favorite actor, but Robert De Niro, a close second. <laughs> uh, so he was very, and in one sense, Sonny had a very controlled temper. In the movie, the Sonny was a hothead. Sonny Frances was not a hothead, mm. but he was, he, he did have a look that people described where he could just bore into you. And once you saw that look and I saw it, it set you back because you knew there was something different from the charming avuncular smart guy who Sonny was when he was talking to people. And the other, know, yeah. I'm sorry, the other no, similarity he had with Sonny in the movie is Sonny Frances slept with just about every woman he could. And he slept with celebrities, Jane Mansfield, Diane Carroll, Marilyn Monroe. Ava had, Gardner. Well, he didn't sleep with Ava Gardner. He had a makeout session with Ava Gardner while her boyfriend, Frank Sinatra, was on the stage at the Copacabana performing. And he just did that because he and Frank Sinatra had this uneasy rivalry. They always jousted to see who was better than the other. And at one point, because I interviewed Sonny multiple times for the book, and I said to him, did you know Frank Sinatra? And he said, you asked the question the wrong way. You should have asked, did Frank Sinatra know Sonny Frances? Wow. <laughs> he was, and you met him at, when he was 100 years old. Yes. Which is yeah. unusual for a mob boss to be living that long in the first place. Well, it is. And he attributed to the fact that everyone in his family lived long lives, but he outlived all his siblings uh, and he wasn't the oldest. Um, he did spend about almost 30 years in prison, which probably saved him from some of the wars that were happening out in the streets. He did not drink or smoke. He would have an occasional glass of wine. So unlike his contemporaries who would have these long wine-fueled pasta lunches, Sonny was very disciplined. He worked out, he'd, he'd uh, grab a sandwich on the run, and he, he stuck to business. He wasn't someone, he, was, he exercised extreme self-discipline. And he also gave up sugar when he was in the army. And he thought that was something uh, that was important. However, the first time I met him, I brought him a tray of Italian cookies because I thought you should have an offering for a mob boss. And he tells me he doesn't eat cookies. And I said, well, I, I guess we should take these. But guess what? He took the cookies. <laughs> ah, <laughs> and you also brought him pasta for jewel. Yes. You know, at, at the end of our first interview, he complained. He, he hit his tray in the nursing home because it was rice and some kind of bland food. And he said, oh, I can't stand this. And I said, well, and I now realize he was performing for me. And I walked right into it. And I said, well, what do you want to eat? I'll, I'll bring you lunch next time. So I ticked off all these different options, you know, penne out of vodka, shrimp scampi, all these sort of high-end Italian things. And he said, pasta fazool, <laughs> which of course is, is a traditional dish that's very hard to find. There was only one place in Queens that we could find that actually made traditional pasta fazool. But that's what I brought him every time after that. Um, that's great. And now let's talk about, I mean, uh, yes, he, he was as vicious of a mobster as they come. I mean, when he said, you know, I, I killed a lot of guys, not five, six, seven, or even 10, we're talking f maybe 40 or 50. Right. Right. You right. know, and he was never, he was never imprisoned for murder. No, he was tried for ordering the hit on Ernie the Hawk Rapolo, who was a one-eyed hitman who killed a lot of people for the mob. And his body was found uh, in Jamaica Bay, New York. Uh, it had floated to the surface, despite the fact that they had tied it to two concrete blocks, because the killers had made the mistake of not slitting open the stomach. A key when you want a body to sink is to slit open the stomach. 
And instead it rose to the surface and it was discovered by a 16 year old boy. And Sonny was charged with the murder, but he got off uh, at the last minute, a surprise witness showed up and helped Sonny get acquitted. You met him through a guy that you name in the book only as Frankie Blue Eyes. And yes, you still yes. don't know his last name. I do not know his last name, and that's exactly how it, he likes it. Um, although I talk to him all the time. And what you realize about guys who certainly reach, guys who reach Sonny's level, he was the underboss of the Colombo crime family. So he was very smart. And Frankie was very close to him. And at one point I was talking about, oh, I can get these records if I put in a freedom of information request. And Frankie Blue Eyes walked over to the videographer and he said, is Sandra gonna put in a freedom of information request about me? And he said, Frankie, we don't know your last name. He said, good, good. That's how I want it. And I never, I've never learned it. Now, when I was reading, when I was reading the book, my initial thought, Frankie Blue Eyes, Frank Sinatra, but he, Sinatra died before you even met Frankie Blue Eyes. Oh, absolutely. There's no connection between the two whatsoever. Yeah. 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 Let's talk about his days at the Copa. I mean, he, uh, that was, that was back in the days when the Copacabana in New York was the place to go. If you wanted to make, get your career made, that's where, I mean, Dean Martin, Bobby Darren, uh, who else? Sammy Davis Jr. Absolutely. Uh, Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra, yeah. Uh, June Allison was a Copa girl. It was the place to be with his fake coconut trees and, and um, the dance line. But they ran it like a private club. There was a dress code. And unescorted women could not come in. But Sonny's wife, Tina, because Sonny always went in the back door because he caused such a stir when he walked into the club, he would try to go in through the back door and Tina would go in the front door and she was one of the only women who was ever escorted in alone, but she would be taken straight, straight to Sonny's table. And I once asked Sonny, I said, well, where did you sit at the Copacabana? And he said, wherever I wanted. <laughs> Literally, if they uh, were full, they would put a table on the on the stage for Sonny. Now, you know, the silent partner of the Copacabana was Frank Costello, who was a close friend of Sonny's, also a Colombo crime family guy who ultimately rose to uh, believe, be the boss. They, but they were very, very close. And so I know Costello wasn't Colombo. I may be confused on that. I'm thinking of Joe Colombo, but Joe Costello was another mobster who had a silent. Part. How did he get? How did he get involved with the Copa, though? I mean, was it just a natural progression that mobsters run nightclubs? Well, yeah. I mean, there were a lot of mobsters in nightclubs in in New York City because it's a lot of money, it's a lot of cash that can't be traced, so there's an easy skim. And so what Costello did is they they put a guy. Monty Prosser on the liquor license because he had a clean record. And then they put this former butcher, Jules Padel, in charge of the club and he ran it. And Jules Padel had a hard docs background. He was tough. He had so, I think he had a stab wound, a, a healed stab wound on his leg. I mean, he was a tough guy and he ran that club. Sonny loved the fact that he was always watching. And whenever he saw something that he didn't like, he would tap his onyx ring that he wore in his pinky on a glass. And a waiter would come over and he would tell them what needed to be done. Wow. So he, <laughs> he held them to very, very high standards. Now, he, when, he was, when he was there, I'm going I'm to stick with the Copa because it's such an interesting story. I'm, he, uh, you know, like you said, he, he gave the boost in the careers to uh, Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis, I would mm -hmm. imagine, because they're the ones who, they are the ones that, that's when they really made it big was when they were playing the Copa. And um, was there, how was his relationship with his, with his famous uh, connections? Well, 
they loved him. And the reason they loved him is Sonny had a genuine ear for talent. He loved talented singers and actors and performers because he knew they could make money. He was a connoisseur of talent. And he wasn't the kind of mobster who tried to put his girlfriend on the payroll. He let these guys be who they were. And Bobby Darren, great singer, was with Sonny, which means he had to give Sonny a piece of whatever he was doing. Uh, and he, Bobby Darren and Frank Sinatra had a real rivalry because as Sonny said, Bobby Darren had a better voice than Sinatra. Bobby Darren could hit notes that Sinatra could never hit. And so there was a real rivalry, but it went untested because as I'm sure most of your listeners know, Bobby Darren died at the age of 37 after open heart surgery. So he could never reach his full potential as a singer. And also Sandra D could not sing a note apparently. Well, it, <laughs> it was funny because during our first interview, uh, about midway through the first interview, Sonny looked at me and he said, what's your name, Samantha? Because suddenly he realized I could be useful to him. And I said, no, not Samantha, Sandra, like Sandra D. And he said, oh, lovely girl, but she couldn't sing a note. You know? <laughs> he didn't claim to have uh, slept with her, which I thought was, you know, so he was pretty honest about the, the women he bedded and the women he didn't. You know? So in reading your book, it looks like the only one he really regretted in bedding down, for want of a better term, was Marilyn Monroe. Well, yes, and he regretted that because Joe DiMaggio, her at that point, ex-husband was his hero. He loved Joe DiMaggio. He grew up watching him and he was an athlete and he admired good athletes. And he told me this story when um, Marilyn Monroe, the famous night when she came out, she was at Madison Square Garden and she was in this skin tight rhinestone studded gown. Mm -hmm. And she sang happy birthday to President John Kennedy. And on the that was on the stage, but on in the auditorium, Joe DiMaggio was running after Sonny because he wanted to talk to him about Marilyn. And Sonny ran away. He was too ashamed to talk to him. And it's the only time I ever, ever, ever heard Sonny talk about being ashamed of something or running away because Sonny never backed down. It just wasn't who he was. But he respected DiMaggio that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the Copa, he went into the music business um, uh, be, with Roulette, was it Roulette Record? No, uh, Buddha, Buddha Records. Right, right. But he also, he hung around Roulette Records a lot because he was friendly with Mo Levy, who was with the Genovese family. And so, you know, he hung out with guys he was comfortable with. And one day when I was talking to Sonny, he's telling me about how he hung this songwriter out the window of the 11 story Brill building. And he couldn't remember the name of the song. He said it was about laundry. And I'm thinking, what song could it have been about laundry? Well, sure enough, Sonny was right. Because in 1964, there was a hit song, Leader of the Pack. And Roulette had created this novelty group called the Detergents who recorded a song written by Paul Vance called Leader of the Laundromat. And it was a parody of Leader of the Pack. And it was wildly successful. It sold 900,000 copies. And of course, the detergents wanted their royalties. But Mo Levy, who at that time, I think he was on his fourth wife and he gambled and he had horses and a large estate, he was down to his last $10,000. So he wasn't going to give it to him. And he said all the records came back unsold. So I spoke to Ron Dante, who was one of the detergents, and he said, yeah, you know, we, we realized it was uh, the better part of valor for us to get out of there. Mm -hmm. But Paul Vance, to whom I also spoke, said, no, I wanted my money. And he slugged Mo Levy. And Everybody jumped up, Sonny yelled, the window, the window, you dumb bastard. And they hung him out the window. And he told him, you give, give Mo that money or we're going to drop you on the ground. And Paul Vance said, you got it. And they pulled <laughs> it back up. 
And after that, and this, this part is hard to understand, but, I, but they both told me this, they became friends because they admired Vance's guts because nobody else had the guts to slug Mo Levy. Paul Vance did. Wow, and then it became Kama Sutra Records. Well, it was, um, Kama Sutra was a different company associated with Buddha Records, right. and Sonny had a silent partnership in Kama Sutra Records. And they pumped out you know, a lot of the bubblegum hits of the mid 1960s. They did all those, and they, were all, they all made a lot of money, and Sonny did with them. Yeah, and I remember one song on the on the Kama Sutra label. I don't know why I remember this because I bought it when it first came out. Uh, called "Put Your Hand in the Hand of the Man." It was a folk song. Oh, I vaguely remember that. Yeah, yeah. That's, and um, that was on the Kama Sutra label. Which I, when I was reading the book, I was like, "Wow, that's that's unusual for for a religious folk song to be on the same label that was being backed by a, by basically a mobster." Well, one thing I've learned about mobsters is religion, ethnicity, whatever, really doesn't matter to guys like Sonny. What matters is money. And that's <laughs> what they wanted to do. Now, even when he was in prison, even when he was ind uh, indicted and put on trial, he never broke the code of silence, though, so, for the mafia. No. He, no, he was famous for that. And one of the things that uh, sort of amazed me when I called around to find guys who knew him they revere him to this day on the street. And even men in law enforcement, and I'm, I'm talking about men because it was mostly men in law enforcement at the time they were chasing Sonny, they respect him too because he never ratted anyone out. And of course, the sad irony of his life is that two of his sons did in fact become rats and provided information to the government. His son, Michael Frances, who is his his adopted son, he, Michael is Tina's son from her first marriage, and Tina is Sonny's second wife. Uh, Michael was uh, making a lot of money for the Columbos, and he got caught loan sharking, extorting, and doing all sorts of things, and he was looking at 10 years in prison, and he provided information on, to the feds on gangsters all over the country. And then Sonny's youngest son, John Jr., who was the favorite of the family, wore a wire on Sonny and ultimately testified against him. That's when Sonny started giving all of his little secrets away, saying that um, you got, I mean, when you use acid to get rid of the body. Right. Dry right. it out. I never, I mean, dry it out in a microwave. Is that, was that one of his tricks? Well, I, I think for um, pieces of the body. But, not, yeah dismembered yeah, bodies yeah 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 and that's what he that's when he was telling his uh his son who was wearing yeah. a wire all this yeah. yeah if you can't trust your family who can you trust you know <laughs> <laughs> and the, the sad part is john always described Sonny as a great father michael did too they they all said he, he was a calm presence in the house their mother, Tina, could be volatile and strict and, and punish them often. But Sonny was always, always came to their games, was very supportive, and he loved them. His one weakness, Sonny's one weakness, was his family. Amazing. Now, when you, when you first decided to uh, talk to uh, Sonny Frances, did it give you pause? I mean, or had you, had you, done, had you done interviews with mobsters before? Yes, I, I have interviewed mobsters before. Um, I knew enough when I was younger to stay away from mobsters because, look, I grew up in Minnesota. I don't have any yeah. street smarts. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And these the low-level guys you got to worry about because they're the ones who will do stupid things to prove their bona fides. You don't worry so much about the higher-level guys because they've got more to lose and they're not as likely to go after a civilian like me. But there have been some scary moments with this book. Uh, these are not good people. <laughs> so, is there one that you can? Is there one that you can tell me about? Well, there have been a couple of attempts to shake me down, but really? uh, but there's not a lot of money in books, and once that became apparent, um, there wasn't an issue. But it's yeah, it's been frightening at times. I tell you what, we are. Are you doing any more books? 
I am looking for the next subject of my book and it's got to be big and bold and as big as sunny. And so it's frustrating because I haven't hit upon it yet, but yes, there will be another book. I just haven't fallen in love with it yet. See, for <laughs> me, I, everybody asks me, what's your favorite story? What's your favorite book? And for yeah. me, I have to fall in love with the subject. That doesn't mean that um, I admire Sonny. I admired his smarts and his humor and his cunning. Uh, but he was still a very bad guy with a oh. big life. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, from, from what I've read, it sounds like, you know, and he was not ashamed no. of the life that he had led. No, no. He was an unabashed bad guy. He was very proud of, you know, he was first inducted into the mafia when he was 14. He did his first murder at the age of 14. And he was proud of that. And Sonny, you know, there's been a lot put out there by the Francis, uh, by Michael Francis about the Francis family, but the book is from Sonny's perspective, his mm -hmm. point of view. And there are a lot of things that haven't been reported before, like the fact that he did his first murder at the age of 14. There's a TV show now, it's about, I guess it's about the making of The Godfather called The Offer. Yeah, yeah. Have you yeah. seen it? I haven't. I've read about it, but I've got to yeah. watch it. Hear about it. I was just wondering if, if any of it, you know, if you'd seen it, if any of it was accurate, but since you hadn't seen it yet, I, I don't, I don't, I haven't seen it yet either, I confess, you know, but. Well, I do know in the making of The Godfather, the producer, Albert Ruddy, had arranged for all these scenes to be shot in New York City. And then all of a sudden, Joe Colombo started creating a ruckus, claiming that he was disparaging Italian Americans. And so they had to reach an agreement and literally pay off the Colombo family in order to get the, be able to film at the scenes where they wanted to wanted to film. Oh wow. Well and Sonny got a piece of that. So he does have a tie-in, he does have a tie-in with the Godfather movie. Oh, an absolute financial piece. And by the way, he got that money while he was in prison. <laughs> hey, if you can make it, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Sandra Petty, S.J. Petty, the, I appreciate you being here. The book is called Sonny, the Last of the Old Time Mafia Bosses? Yes. Bosses. Yes. So I appreciate you really taking time tonight to talk, talk to us on Lights, Camera, Author. Well, thank you so much. This has been fun, and please read the book. Sonny, the Last of the Old Time Mafia Bosses is written by S.J. Petty and published by Citadel Press. Until next time, I'm Jim Juno, and this has been Light Camera Author.